You know, there are two really comfortable chairs right here if you want to sit here. Right up front. I promise not, to, like front I promise not to spit on you if I get going. He won't spit too much. Yeah. Okay. So, do you want to start now? Is everybody ready to start? I always wait five or ten minutes, but I'm thinking we should just say F it, because if you're late, you're late. Yeah, exactly like that. So my name Spoken is like a school teacher, right? <laughs> uh, my name is Katie Jesse, and I'm the event coordinator here for People's Books. Um, just a logistical thing: if you would like a glass of water, we have a kitchen of sorts in the back. Feel free to go grab yourself one. This is a co-op, <coughs> so feel free. Um, a lot of you are members, so this is your store too. Um, the restroom is through the office, directly that way. If you need to use it at any point in the evening. And for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm pretty sure everyone in here knows, but I give the same spiel at every event. Um, because we're a co-op, that means we have no hierarchy and no, own, no single owner. Um, every member of the store is officially owner of the store. So uh, as an owner of the store, I would like to welcome you to my bookstore. <laughs> um, I love doing events for local authors. We have uh, Barry Whiteman in the audience who was here last night. He's a local author. If you're interested in doing an event at the store, you can go to our website, peoplesbookscoop.org, and my contact information is um, under the event uh, contact info. Um, we have uh, several copies of Bill's new book, Public Enemy. Um, we also have his last memoir, Fugitive Days. If you're interested in purchasing those, um, our lovely board member, Dennis, is going to stick around afterwards, and I'm sure Bill will sign copies. Um, I'm super stoked that Bernadine was here, too. Um, Bernadine Dorn, right here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so without further ado, Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn. Much. <clears throat> thank you so much, and thank you for having us here. I'm going to stand because I feel I'll, you won't hear me otherwise. Cause, and I forgot to put my hearing aids in, number one, so you have to shout questions. And number two, I had my knee replaced five weeks ago, so I can only stand for a while. So that'll, that'll limit. I'm just giving the old people here a little, uh, a little juice. But... Uh, but I will read a couple of things. Bernadine and I go back and forth about this, but she always says, I have to read. People come to these things expecting you to read, so I will read a little bit. Bernadine retired from running a clinic at Northwestern Law School called the Children and Family Justice Center about five weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, a great center, as you know. And, uh, and after, you know, 20 years, 25 years of that, and so she's been accompanying me the last two weeks on this, and it's been a great thing kind of to have somebody to worry about my knee and also to <laughs> censor me when I'm going off the deep end, which I often do. So I'm going to read a little bit, and then we're going to have a conversation, and Bernadine is going to join in um, to that. Um, I want to say a, 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 another word about, about this bookstore. You know, after Fugitive Days was published, and the pub date on Fugitive Days was 9-11, 2001. <laughs> And some of you remember, it was a firestorm. I mean, the 2008 campaign with me being the public enemy kind of surpassed it. But, but at the time, it was really something. And I was on a book tour with Fugitive Days for the next three months. And universities canceled me. Um, you know, humanities festivals canceled me. But independent bookstores and libraries never canceled. And, and it's one of the great things. So you all know this because this is your bookstore. But... These things are not to be taken for granted. As the public space is closing, an institution like this is of tremendous value. So I hope you don't have to buy Public Enemy, but buy a book, right? Yes. Just find a book on the shelf. Find book randomly find. buy it um, just to support this marvelous and unique institution. All right, I'm going <clears> to <throat> speak a little bit about this. I'll try to keep my reading and comments to 15 minutes, or she says a little more. Okay, we'll see. And then we'll open it up. Um, so, the book, <clears throat> Fugitive Days, was the story, a memoir, of the years 1965 to 75, primarily, the years of the American War in Vietnam. And uh, it was really like any memoir, you know, people who read it 
expected it to be a manifesto or a history, which it was not. It was a memoir. And the task, as I understand it, of memoir is to put a character, myself, in a landscape and without the benefit of hindsight to watch how that person makes decisions and traverses the, the, the territory. That's what I did there. This book picks up where that book ends. So it's 1975 up to the 2008 campaign. But just to get us started so that the title makes sense, I start in the 2008 <coughs> campaign. And so I will read just a little bit from the opening. It's a, it's a prologue. And it takes place um, <clears throat> in our living room, where Burnley and I often had our classes, our seminars meet. And I had a seminar of graduate students. It was in April 2008. We had been discussing research and, and uh, oral history and ethnography. And as the, as the seminar came to an end, someone who just couldn't wait to see the debate turned on the Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama debate on ABC, moderated by Stephanopoulos, and so that's where I'm going to pick up. Uh, my students are all sitting around the living room. I'm mildly disinterested in the whole thing, but um, <laughs> Stephanopoulos had just asked Obama about his friendship with Jeremiah Wright. Do you think he's as patriotic as you are? And I'll pick up there. <clears throat> now Stephanopoulos was bearing down on the, quote, general theme of patriotism in your relationships. A gentleman named William Ayers, Stephanopoulos began. He was part of the Weather Underground in the 1970s. They bombed the Pentagon, the Capitol, and other buildings. He's never apologized for that. An early organizing meeting for your state Senate campaign was held at his house. And your campaign has said you are, quote, friendly. Can you explain the relationship for the voters and explain to Democrats why it won't be a problem? I thought Obama looked slightly stricken, temporarily off balance, and uncharacteristically tongue-tied. I was probably projecting, because I felt suddenly dizzy, off balance, and tongue-tied myself. But I know for sure my students were thunderstruck. Their heads snapped in my direction, and a few literally dropped to the floor, one with both hands over her mouth. Obama replied, quote, This is a guy who lives in my neighborhood, is a professor of English in Chicago, who I know, and who I have not received some official endorsement from. The notion that somehow as a consequence of a consequence of me knowing somebody who engaged in detestable acts 40 years ago when I was eight years old somehow reflects on me and my values doesn't make much sense now, does it, George? An explosion of laughter ricocheted around the room. Some were genuinely amused, some disbelieving and a bit horrified, everyone clamoring to make sense of the bombshell that had just dropped into our little seminar and by extension reverberated around the country and the world. I sat down and the student who'd shushed me a moment before turned to me and said, oh my God, that guy has the same name as yours. Another explains we're excited to leave, but that's because we were indeed the same guy. Bill is the guy, and we're in the neighborhood George is talking about. <laughs> Imagine her surprise. <laughs> they were amazed to see me cast on TV as some kind of public enemy, and even though I knew the connection was a story that had been percolating in the fever swamps of the right-wing blogs for months, I was amazed too. Bernadine Dorn and I had hosted the initial fundraiser for Obama and uncharacteristically donated a little money to his campaign for the Illinois Senate. We lived a few blocks apart, and he and I had sat on a couple of nonprofit boards together. Who would have predicted it could blow up like this? A, a guy around the neighborhood, as funny as it sounded, I thought Obama got it exactly right. <clears throat> No one in the living room could have seen this coming. By the time everyone settled down, the debate was done. My students stuck around for quite a while, a bit dazed, I think. Someone pointed out helpfully that I wasn't a professor of English, but of education. And someone else wondered aloud how this line of attack might impact with Senator Obama's chances. Most were super considerate, asking what I needed and attending to me as if I'd been hit by a truck, which is a bit how I felt, too. How are you? Can I get you some tea? And then, how well did you know him? Are you thrilled or are you miserable to be associated like this? <laughs> I think for some of them, there was an abrupt awareness that while they'd known me quite well, just moments before, now they suddenly didn't know me at all. That made sense to me too, because for a moment I wondered who I was. When they finally trickled out, some still shaking their heads in marvelous disbelief, others smiling in wonder, each offered a, hand, a hug or a handshake. It was a bizarre end of seminar moment, but quite tender. 
The evening became more surreal. No sleep, of course, and lots of phone calls from everywhere. Lots of disbelief and laughter and support, as well as some sense of foreboding and apprehension. <clears throat> Fantastic, unreal, and crazy. Bill Ayers had been quiet and still fermenting on a dusty shelf in an unused laboratory for decades when he was abruptly plucked from a jar of brine. Suddenly there he was, a little wrinkled, dripping and smelling of vinegar and garlic, but alive. And the weather underground, suspended in amber all those years, was reborn out of the blue, not only active and breathing fire, but all of a sudden more menacing and dangerous and far, far better known than it had ever been before. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation had been administered by the fringe, but its resurrection now lay in the hands of an opportunistic media and eager campaign staffs to the right, the middle, and even the moderate left. <clears throat> there were some threats that night, but, but there was also, now I'm skipping, but there were some threats and some craziness that night. But there was also a lot of unexpected love from the start. The sweetest and quirkiest came from a colleague at the University of Illinois at Chicago who was a Democratic Party activist. For several months, Espy Reyes had stopped by my office right next door to hers, and with all the current gossip or insights or hopes or fears from the Democrats, and always with the latest combat from with her own, within her own family. She and her daughter were diehard for Hillary, her husband and son-in-law equally strong for Barack. She suspected a deep sexist attitude in her husband, mysteriously undetected somehow oh. in decades of marriage. I always listened a little bemused. I'm glad I'm not a Democrat, I would inevitably say. I can watch and I don't have to worry. She would smile impatiently. It's Hillary's turn, Bill, and you know it. Obama's so young, he can come next. For women of a certain age, there's a dream come true. And then she'd say, she can beat whoever the Republicans put up, but Obama's just a kid and he'll get crushed. One day she repeated that the, she reported that the tension at home over the primary had finally reached a fever pitch and boiled over and that John was now sleeping on the couch. I sympathized. Now I'm really glad I'm not a Democrat, I said. I flew to California the morning after the Stephanopoulos moment to do some work with my brother. When I finally got settled and could open my email, I found four messages from Espy that she sent over a span of 18 hours. The first was a magical note of, of friendship and love and sympathy for what she imagined I must be going through. The second, sent many hours later, was a copy of a long letter she drafted to Hillary Clinton detailing how much money she donated and how many weekends she devoted in Wisconsin and Michigan to organizing on her behalf, explaining who I really was and encouraging, then demanding that the campaign apologize to me personally and denounce the smears or else she would have to rethink her commitments. The third letter was another copy, this one a message fired off in haste and anger to the Democratic National Committee and its chairman, Howard Dean, in which she proposed a detente and insisted that Dean resolve the escalating warfare for the good of the party. Oh, and apologized to me, of course. She attached a copy of my CV so that Howard Dean could see what a great guy I really was, in her opinion. The fourth and final email was sent after she had a good night's sleep and was just this in full. Quote, I let John come off the couch and back to bed. I hope you're okay. Ah, love. I was at that moment happily beyond okay. All the attacks that had come, all the nonsense hovering just beyond the horizon, seemed for that moment a small price to pay for the ecstasy of reunion and the many blissful years ahead beckoning to Espy and John. <clears throat> I'll stop there on that question. Um, Onward. Onward. I'm looking. Um. So are Esky and John still together? They are Married. not only together, but we when we read in L.A. last week, um, their daughter uh, came to the reading and son-in-law, and they have a new baby. So Esky and John have a granddaughter, and um, they made a point. To, uh, the daughter made a point of pointing out which details I got wrong. Okay. And, and I love that because everywhere I read, you'll hear some things, Mike, that I got wrong because it's a memoir. It's just what I remember. And the opening line of Fugitive Days is, memory is a motherfucker. I remember nothing. You know, which is kind of uh, just throwing down the gauntlet for memoir. Um, okay, let me just see. I'm going to pick up. So, as I say, it really starts in 1975 when we turn ourselves in um, and moves up towards 2008. So here's a little piece about our kids. Um, 
we had very young children when we turned ourselves in. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't Our, always wait on him. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> For 43 years, we've been trying to get it right. Okay. Our children were the hub and heart of everything, and the little daycare center became the nucleus of the everyday. Finding that magical place three years before turning ourselves into the authorities was one of those miraculous moments when choice and chance suddenly rhyme. Malik had not been born yet, and Zaid was a year old when we first toddled into that enchant enchanted spot. We were using a not-so-clever or imaginative underground moniker for our baby, simply the letter Z. His name was Zaid, so we called him Z. I was called Tony Lee because Lee seemed to be the most common surname in the Manhattan phone directory, and Bernadine was Lou. Tony Lee, Lou Lee, and Z Lee. It had the rhythmic sound of three high school friends gathered in a garage with wildly inflated dreams of rock and roll glory. <laughs> We'd been in New York for just a few months then, living in a single shabby room in a Skid Row hotel near Times Square. The roaches were in an unending scuffle with the temporary victory declared by us whenever the battlefield moved from our bed to the tiny sink under a bare light bulb in the far corner. The shared bathroom down the hall was a challenge too, especially with a toddler to keep sparkling and clean. But the folks on our floor, old men with hard times etched into every crease of their leathery faces, were kind and accommodating, being sure to clear a shining path to the old tin tub or the, toilet or the toilet whenever necessary. Love the kid, they'd say warmly, wrinkling into a smile or peekabooing to get a guaranteed happy response from Z. Bernadine had worked a temp service job into a regular secretarial position at an office nearby which allowed us to meet up at a diner for lunch and a chance to nurse every day. We settled into a suitable routine, heading out, the hotel, out of the hotel and onto the street by 7.30 each morning. A quick coffee and bagels at the corner dive and then Lou off to work, that's the Z and I to the train in one of the several spots we'd found to, to be perfect winter playgrounds for him. The Metropolitan Museum of Art with its Knights and Armor Room, Macy's Toy Section with the plush carpets and giant stuffed animals, the Guggenheim with its massive circular ramp rising to the sky, Shakespeare and Company with children's books, children's books galore. By 10, we were back at the diner in Times Square, ready for replenishment and renewal. When I began to look for work in earnest, we auditioned a couple of different babysitters we'd found through word of mouth, but neither was quite right, and nothing worked out beyond a morning or two. Perhaps we were overly critical or hypersensitive. Perhaps handing over our precious one to someone else for the first time was just too alarming, and being without him for more than an hour at a time, a bit unbearable. Or perhaps these two caregivers really were inadequate. Perhaps we'd let him get out of our sight when he was 21 years old, we joked. Who knew? But because we were unsettled and unsure, and because we trusted our own instincts, we decided to keep on looking, unhurried and deliberate. One, morning, one Monday morning, after a quick trip to the Natural History Museum and a visit with the giant whale suspended from the ceiling on the lower level, Z and I made our way up to 84th Street near Riverside Drive, only a few blocks away, but an authentic expedition for a toddler practicing the fine art and exciting skill of walking with his willy, willing papa wobbling along behind, and with the New York City sidewalks filled with giant bags of garbage and other fascinating objects fit for close examination. We were off to visit with a woman who was just beginning a child care center in the basement of a brownstone. A mom we'd met at the playground had referred to us to BJ's kids. BJ is amazing, she told us, and it's affordable, committed care. Nice, we like that, affordable and committed. Well, we couldn't be sure what those two words meant exactly, we figured that they had, had to signify something specific. She could have chosen other pairs, cheap and faithful, or <laughs> sparkling clean, or tough love. To us, affordable struck an immediate and essential chord, and committed meant so much more. It was a stretch for sure, but we imagined that somehow she might be part of our extended and far-flung tribe, our very own beloved community. It turns out we weren't wrong. When I talked to her on the phone, she was super friendly and wide open, and she urged us to drop by any time. I liked that. She didn't need to clean up her act or prep for her performance. Just come down the front stairs, she said. We're in the garden apartment. Whatever we were about to see was just what we'd get. Zayd and I jumped down the steps one by one to the garden apartment entrance. 
New York real estate folks had rechristened basement spaces, garden apartments years before, probably figuring that that basements are cousins to cellars and crypts and caves, while gardens are a bit of Eden, all green and sunny with vegetables and flowers. And we rang the bell. We were buzzed into a small, delicious-smelling kitchen and made our way to the big room beyond, which to my delight was way more cabbage patch than crypt, a child's garden of color and light streaming with early childhood energy. BJ looked comfortable on a sprawling green beanbag chair, swaddled in a tangle of toddlers. She smiled and waved to us and kept on reading a big book about a mouse and a whale, best friends for life. Z hurried off and began stocking blocks, stacking blocks while I settled into a tiny chair to watch the action. BJ was about my age, maybe early 30s, her jet black hair cut into a page boy that framed her perfectly round and pale face. She was dressed for action, high tops, rough stitched fatigue pants, oversized corduroy shirts sporting two big pockets with no fear of tearing, wrinkling, staining, or mussing. She resembled the grown-up Buster Brown, the pretty cross-dressing comic book hero from the turn of the century, whose charming demeanor hit a mischievous heart in a critical consciousness. Buster Brown's constant companion was his dog, Tig. BJ's roommate was a giant, cuddly English sheepdog called Daisy. Like Buster, BJ was a living, lovable contradiction. The space was a perfect reflection, an enchanted jumble. There were books and bookshelves everywhere, easels and paint supplies in one corner, wooden blocks in another, a large round table with eight little blue chairs in the middle, and a row of colorful cubby holes against one wall in the kitchen, each with a name, a few family photos, a change of clothes, and a favorite stuffy or snack or blanket. All the kids were part-time then, so while there were only six kids in the space now, there were dozens of cubbies. The toddlers were busy, 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 someone scribbling a wild a wildly, um, somebody, someone scribbling wildly with big colorful chalk on the linoleum floor, someone else pushing cars up the ramp, others listening to the story, their natural narcissism on full display, and BJ, unruffled and at ease, finished the book, gently swished the kids from her lap to the table, and greeted me again on her way to get the apples and bananas she arranged at the table. The place hummed with the good anarchistic energy of toddlers at work, and BJ's kids had the feel of a sweet, if slightly screwball family with a surplus of very young children getting into everything in every corner. When we visited again with Bernadine later in the week, we all felt right at home and vowed never to leave. I'm going to stop that part right there. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to read just one more little section. And I'm not going to read about the kids. I'm going to read about... Um, I'm going to read about uh, being blacklisted. One of the things that happened in 2008, and it continues to this day, and some of you know it because you were here when I was being picketed, I can't go anywhere except apparently tonight, but who knows, they might show up. Um, I get picketed a lot whenever I speak at campuses. or, And so I have a whole section here called Talking to the Tea Party, and um, a whole section about being blacklisted. And the important thing about blacklists is that they they take on different um, meaning in different times, and I never felt, and I don't feel, um, that it's really that I have a particularly hard time of it. I actually feel like I just happen to be, you know, on their website and on their, um, so they just mobilize. Like I spoke at Elgin Community College, west of Chicago, two weeks ago, and they had hundreds of emails complaining about taxpayer money supporting me coming out to give a talk, you know, for a nickel or whatever they paid me, and. Uh, and they were all from Broward County, Florida. And you're like, damn, you know, really, Broward County? All pissed off about Elgin having me. Well, um, but it really became a kind of a crazy crescendo in, in 2008, and, short, and it's continued. Um, I'm going to read a little tiny section about that. Okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> getting out from I don't know what I'm getting. <laughs> Soon enough, the groans, I, I, I was banned in Colorado, I was banned in Nebraska, and, and I talk about those, and I say, Soon enough, the groans of the idiot wind gathered force and focus and became a roaring tempest. I was banned in Boston, Boston University, actually, by order of its little dictator, the chancellor, and canceled in Cambridge. Scheduled lectures were shut, were shut down in Sacramento, as well as Urbana, Champaign, Georgia, Texas, Florida, and dozens of other places. Penn State University earned some kind of distinction in my mind. I got an email one, one morning inviting me to give a talk to a student group. 
I accepted the request before noon and by 2 p.m. that same day, shortly after the administration was informed, my invitation was rescinded. The rationalizations varied. In Boston, the chancellor at BU didn't want to offend the feelings of the families of police officers killed in the line of duty, an entirely manufactured correlation. In Georgia, the president cited threats to burn down the campus center as the reason I would be banned. And in my sister campus at Urbana-Champaign, the president cited exhaustion from defending me at board meetings and at every Illinois state legislative hearing. All that freedom of speech stuff could really take a toll on the poor guy. That's what I mean about independent bookstores. Cancellations and abandonment continued apace, and the tempest leapt completely out of the teapot. Officials at the University of Wyoming, citing security threats and controversy, canceled two talks I'd been asked to give there. One, a public lecture entitled Trudge Toward Freedom, Moral Commitment and Ethical Action, and the other, a talk to faculty and graduate students called Teaching and Research in the Public Interest, Solidarity and Identity. One be week before I was to travel to Laramie, I was told I'd been disinvited. A campaign to rescind the invitation had been initiated on right-wing blogs months earlier, accelerating quickly to a wider space where a demonizing storyline dominated all discussion and a wave of hateful messages and death threats hit the university, joined soon enough by a few political leaders and wealthy donors instructing officials in ominous tones to cancel my visit to the campus or else. This was becoming drearily familiar to me. A particularly despicable note in that campaign was written by Frank Smith, who lived in Cheyenne and was active in the Wyoming Patriot Alliance. Quote, maybe someone should take him out and show him the Matthew Shepard commemorative fence and he could bless it or something. He was referring to Matthew Shepard, the young gay man who was tortured and murdered in 1998, left to die tied to a storm fence outside Laramie. Republican gubernatorial candidate Ron Michelli released a letter he'd sent to trustees asking them to rescind the invitation. And Matt Mead, the other gubernatorial candidate, said that while he was a self-described fervent believer in free speech and the free exchange of ideas, allowing me to speak would be reprehensible. <laughs> he concluded that I should have no place lecturing our students. I told the folks that invited me how sorry I was that all this was happening to them, but I thought it would pass. Certainly, no matter what a couple of thugs threatened to do, I thought not much would happen. We should stand together and refuse to accede to those kinds of pressures. After all, a public uni university is not the personal fiefdom or the political clubhouse of the governor. And donors can't be permitted to call the shots when it comes to the content or conduct of academic matters. We shouldn't allow ourselves to collapse in fear if a howling mob gathers at the gates with flaming torches in hand. In fact, that's exactly when standing up and pushing back becomes necessary. I wouldn't force myself on the university, of course, but I felt that canceling would be terribly unfair to the faculty and students who'd invited me and would send a big message that bullying works. It would be the equivalent of a book burning, and it would be one more step down the slippery slope of giving up on the precious ideal of a free university and a free society. No good. The university posted an announcement of the cancellation to my visit with a long, rambling comment from President Tom Buchanan that began with the obligatory assertion that academic freedom is a core principle, but quickly added that, quote, freedom requires a commensurate dose of responsibility. We are charged to enact free speech and thought, he wrote, in concert with mutual respect. The heckler's veto had worked perfectly. I suggested that I show up on campus, no announcement, no security, no fanfare, and stand respectfully in front of the student union with a big sign saying, let's talk. I would engage anyone who happened to walk by and chat about anything that came up. Those who thought that the university, quote, had caved into external pressure, President <coughs> Buchanan went on, would be incorrect. While the episode illustrates an opportunity to hear and critically evaluate a variety of ideas thoughtfully, he said, through open reason and civil debate, it demonstrates that we must be mindful of the real consequences our actions and decisions have. So they canceled me, right? Unbelievable. It all felt very Orwellian the whole time, but then this amazing thing happened. I went back to my work and what I do anyway. But I was contacted a few days later by Meg Lanker, an undergraduate who was just back from serving in the military and had been active in opposing the cancellation of my talk. She was a fighter on every level. 
I'm going to sue the university in federal court, court, she told me during our first conversation. And I'm claiming that it's my free speech that's been violated. I have the re right to speak to anyone I want, to read anything I want, and right now I want to speak to you. She was young and unafraid. I liked her immediately. Meg's approach struck me as quite brilliant. Students, and not I, were indeed the injured party. Inviting you wasn't necessarily an endorsement, she went on. I check books out of the library all the time that aren't pre-approved. Let's talk, and who knows, maybe we'll have a huge argument. We have the right to have you here, and they can't <coughs> stop me. My, my family thought <coughs> that for me to travel alone across Wyoming was a bad idea. So Chesa, our youngest son, studying for law, for law school finals, volunteered and became the designated hitter. He flew to meet me at the Denver airport where we rented a car and drove together to Laramie. I wasn't sure he added much muscle, you know, a law student from Yale, but um, he had, we had a lovely drive together and lunch at a dive outside of town with the lawyers and the dissident students, toured the campus with Meg, sat on benches drinking coffee in the beautiful Dick and Lynn Cheney Plaza, and knocked on President, knocked on President Buchanan's door, but he'd gone home early for the day. So I left him a copy of the U.S. Constitution and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That night, close to 1,100 people braved a blizzard and showed up for my talk. I wanted to think they'd all come to hear what I had to say about justice, democracy, and education, but I was realis realistic enough to know that I'd have likely had an audience of 50 without all the drama. There were no pickets, no protests, lots of media, and a lovely surprise. Kurt Minter, my sister-in-law's father and a retired bishop, as well as former minister from the United Church of Christ, where I'd been confirmed decades before, drove a couple of hours to stand in solidarity. I almost didn't recognize him because he was dressed in a dark suit with a clerical collar and a giant wooden cross on his chest. What a great surprise, I said. What are you doing here? The Lord moves in mysterious ways, he said with a wink. If any of the crazy Christians get out of hand, he wants me to set them straight. When I was finally introduced, I could feel the letdown in the audience. Who's that old professor wobbling across the stage? And what happened to the scary terrorist we were expecting? <laughs> you know, you can imagine, they're all, where's the guy breathing fire? Um, a year later, the conservative student club at Wyoming invited Ann Coulter to speak as an antidote to whatever radical ideas and left-wing contaminants I'd left around the place. She was paid $20,000, $10,000 from a wealthy anonymous donor. Think Dick and Lynn Cheney. And there wasn't a single threat of cancellation. Meg and, her, Meg and her crew resisted their first impulse and decided not to pick at the event. Instead, they launched a website and built a social network where folks could pledge a set amount of money for the Matthew Shepard Foundation for every minute that Coulter spoke. I pledged $5 a minute. Meg raised a huge banner outside the auditorium that read, The Ann Coulter Rain Rainbow Queer Tour. Keep talking, Ann. And the website listed below. Ann was 90 minutes late and toward the end of her talk referred to Meg's guerrilla campaign as she shut up and ended the fundraiser at 26 minutes. The Matthew Shepard Foundation collected $10,000 that evening. Keep talking, Ann. It was getting discouraging. Meg and the students at Wyoming had buoyed my spirits, but there was so much going on. But then I got a note from my old comrade, Mike Klonsky, who some of you know from the schoolwork. And he included an email thread that cheered me up immeasurably. Mike and I had been friends for decades, first as student militants and SDS officers together. When he returned to graduate school, I was one of his professors. And later, we'd written on school improvement, edited books, and led a school reform organization together. Mike had gotten an invitation to keynote an education conference, but the letter included this troubling line. We'd planned to invite Bill Ayers, but concluded that his presence would distract from our work because he's too radical now. Mike's note back was written with a flamethrower. Shame on you, he began. How dare you ask me to scab on Bill Ayers. In fact, if you ban Bill, not only will I not give the talk, I might pick at the place and I'll certainly advise everyone to boycott your weak-ass conference. <laughs> Mike's dad had been a communist organizer blacklisted during the Red Scare and indicted under the Smith Act. He'd been underground and on the run from the FBI for a time in the 50s, and Mike instinctively smelled the rats, even when he scented. I called him to give him some love for being a stand-up guy and a principled friend. Thanks a lot, Mike, for defending me, I said. It meant a lot. 
defending you, he replied. I wasn't defending you. I was defending myself. I was deeply and personally offended when they said that you were too radical, and by implication that I wasn't too radical. <laughs> I'm as radical as you are, motherfucker. <laughs> Thanks anyway, Mike. <laughs> Who didn't blacklist you? Who did not blacklist you? But what organizations? Well, as I said, the independent bookstores were absolutely unanimous. And the other thing that we found really public remarkable library. was the public library. Librarians. The Baltimore Public Library got hammered when we were asked mm -hmm. to give a talk there. And the head of the library, an African-American woman in her 40s who was from Chicago, was supposed to be in New York raising money. And she canceled her trip in order to introduce us. She was that pissed off. And they gave us a t-shirt at that library that said, read banned books. And <laughs> if, you, if you want to see, I mean, I, you all may know this, but next to teachers and midwives and nurses, I, I got to say, librarians are just the absolute best. And like me, they're fundamentalists about the First Amendment. You go on their website and you look at how they talk about banning books. They are absolutely open about free speech. So libraries and independent bookstores were the two places that never wavered. Universities were terrible. And humanities festivals and councils were wobbly. Terrible. Because uh, they have funding. You know, well, I was, can we, I was canceled after 9-11 at the Illinois Humanities Festival where I was scheduled to be a featured speaker and I was scheduled to be a featured author at the Chicago Public Library, which Mayor Daly canceled. And the Humanities Festival. Oh, which we'd spoken at for 10 years. So, you know, places. it was just like suddenly, one, one side of the mirror and then the other. It was really Suddenly weird. you found out who your friends were. And the real point about blacklisting is when you see somebody under attack, that's the time you have to stand up in solidarity. It makes a huge difference. That's why I'm partly joking about Mike, but it's really true to, to say, who, who shows up? You know, we have, a, I tell this little story in here, but we have a friend in South Africa who was officially colored during the apartheid. And he described to us just a horrendous thing, which actually matched some of our experiences in this period. He was, he was, as his skin was like hers, but he was colored in the South African scheme of things. And he became, he was a jeweler. And he had a friend who, um, a Jewish guy, white guy, who, who who he used as a kind of a front so he could rent this place in a certain neighborhood. This friend of his rented it for him and he was kind of an employee of his friend but actually it was his business. And For a decade. For a decade. And then the guy came to him one day and said, you know, I'm doing this for you, but what am I getting? And he said, what do you mean? He said, well, shouldn't you pay me a little something just for why? You know, and they had this little argument and then okay, he paid him a little something for the next few years. And then apartheid ended. And this friend of ours was in the ANC and was an activist and so on. And the apartheid ended and he describes running into the guy on the street a few months later. And the guy say, isn't this great? We won. It's like he didn't even remember that he had profited just a little shitty bit. Not, he wasn't a bastard, you know, he wasn't one of the monsters. But just a little bit profiting from that privilege. And yet now it's over and we had that same experience. We had, especially in Grant Park in 2008, everyone who'd shunned us for four months would say, hey, we're best friends. You know, um, it's weird. But I'm urging you, I guess, to say, bookstores, libraries, whoever, but you as individuals, you know, stand with those who are targeted, even if you don't agree with everything that they've done or are about to do. But it's the targeting, it's the smearing, it's the guilt by association. Those things are deadly. Yes? Well, not that it's even necessarily the place, but you're talking libraries, and I actually um, am a librarian, or in process, anyway, <laughs> almost. Um, and I'm thinking about all of those universities have librarians, and I'm wondering how much those librarians knew at that yeah, time, because I, I, I'm imagining that that's the resource, and that's the place where when you had people saying, 
G, you know, or an angry student, or a student who's upset because administration is doing this, chances are the library was going to kick up a great big fuss at that yeah. university if they had been aware of what was going on. I think you're right. I don't know the answer to that. But, you know, it also makes me think, you know, one of the things, I mean, I'm thinking partly of, again, it's not personally about me particularly. I'm thinking about Jeremiah Wright, for example. And you all don't know Jeremiah Wright personally. We do, and he's a... He's an institution in Chicago, and for him to be smeared and at the end of his career turned into a cartoon of fiery black nationalism in the worst, you know, was unspeakable. So it's moments like that when you have to send a note or stand up and, and be heard. Um, at the end of the 2008 campaign, there was this wonderful moment that I write about where Rashid Khalidi, who was really was our best friend for a long, long time in Chicago, uh, they were... The Republicans were buying ads about Rashid Khalidi in Florida. You know, Obama has these friends, Rashid Khalidi, just the name is supposed to terrify elderly Jewish voters, right? And then they were running ads about Jeremiah Wright in California, and they were running ads about me in Michigan and Ohio. And I got a phone call one day from Rashid in New York, and he said, did you see the CNN thing just now? And I said, no, so he sent it to me. <clears throat> CNN reporter in Florida interviewing a high McCain official and he says, you say Barack Obama has um, anti-Semitic friends. Who? And the guy says, Rashid Khalidi. You know, and it's one of those moments. It doesn't need any explanation. It doesn't. The guy's never read Rashid Khalidi's book. He has no idea what he's talking about. But the CNN guy says, who else? You know, he doesn't challenge him. In other words, he's just a stunner. He says, who else? And the McCain guy says, Bill Ayers. And the CNN guy says, without missing a beat, Ayers isn't an anti-Semite, he's a terrorist. And it's like, damn, stay in your lane, you know? And so Rashid called me and said, let's switch places. I'm sick of being an anti-Semite. You be the anti-Semite. I said, no way, man, stay right where you are. <laughs> anyway, it was craziness. It was completely crazy. But what we should be sophisticated enough about, and we should spread the word, is not only that the demonization of these people is a bad thing, and I particularly focused on Jeremiah. But the guilt by association is a deadly, deadly part of American political history. Because you know somebody, you're therefore you know, supposed to own their history, their politics, their experiences. It's just awful. And instead of that, we ought to have all stood up and said, you know, the fact that Barack Obama knows a wide range of people in this wild and crazy democracy is a good thing. It's not a sin. He should know a lot of people. In fact, I wish he listened Jeremiah Wright and me and Rashid more, but never never mind that. He should know a lot of people and we should stand on that. <clears throat> Others? Yes? What spawned uh, the whole media propaganda campaign? Was it just opportunistic and they were trying to sensationalize it and sell papers or was it more political in nature? And well, I think I think it's important to remember, and I this little piece I read points to that, that the narrative about Obama, when people were running, it's hard to remember now because he's such a mega celebrity and mega whatever. But at the time, he was this charismatic, smart, you know, um, very attractive candidate from Illinois. But, but Hillary Clinton began the narrative, and the narrative to run against him was, what do we really know about this guy? He's a mystery man. We don't know anything. Let's look at his friends. And then you see this fiery black nationalist and this and this. And, and so... They kept saying this was the narrative Hillary developed. And then she lost, and McCain Palin picked it up and didn't change a word, you know. But this was a, a very, uh, you know, a very thought out way to try to <clears throat> defeat this guy who you couldn't figure out how to get any purchase against it. And it turned out to be a stupid campaign, but it's what they did. I think there's a, you know, you can think back to the swift voting <clears throat> right. against Kerry and Kerry, you know, becoming that, right? forget his opposition to Vietnam as a young soldier coming back and testifying to Congress, he then flipped, you know, and had no memory of that John Kerry. And so and the swift voting campaign worked against him, where you can go back, you know, to... McCarthyism. No, well, this state certainly knows that. I grew up here. My parents voted four times for Joe McCarthy. You know, so <clears throat> I think it's it's there's, there's it's very common in American political life to demonize somebody. It doesn't even matter if it has a shred of truth, right? Uh, it's it's flips, and you just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And so now, 
even the interviews Bill did last week in New York, it's like Bill Ayers' domestic terrorist is one word, <laughs> right? With the liberal networks, with you know NPR, with whoever's talking, it's kind of weird. But it, I guess, the repetition and the, it just becomes the discourse. So it isn't just. I think there's just a long, long tradition about it. The other thing to say that I would like oh, to... Oh, it's, well, it's Horton that I was trying to think Willie of. Willie Horton, right, right. That, Willie that Horton campaign. George Bush. You know, this, it, the, really the most vile and hideous of them all. Racist, yeah. Um, but there you are. It's also, I think, important to remember that when Barack Obama ran for president and when he got the nomination, he said repeatedly, I'm a moderate... You know, um, I'm a moderate, middle-of-the-road, pragmatic politician. And the left looked at him and said, I mean, the right looked at him and said, no, he's a secret Muslim, secret terrorist, pal has a, you know, he's probably a socialist, pals around with this and that. The left looked at him and said, I think he's winking at me. But he wasn't <laughs> winking. You know? And, and the, the problem is that people were looking at him and ascribing to him all kinds of things that weren't necessarily true. And I think that that it's important to remember this in part because it tells us that we sometimes sp spend way too much time looking at the sites of power that we don't have access to. So we want the great man to be great and to give us what we know we deserve and need. And we spend a lot of time dissecting the White House and all the different moves that are made or the Congress, which we have less and less access to. And in doing that, we spend less time than we ought to concentrating on the sites of power we have absolute access to. The street, the neighborhood, the community, the workplace, the school, the classroom. This is where we belong, and this is where we can mobilize real power. Um, and if you look at history, that's the only thing that changes things anyway, power from below. And so... You can see this happening with the de Blasio campaign in New York mm -hmm. now, right? But they're he, kind of hoping he'll be great. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's he just went to visit Wall Street, to, you know, yesterday to to cement what he's going to cement, of course. But don't you know, hate under Blasio. In the Are you hating under Blasio? No, <laughs> just, uh, not at all. I love him. <clears throat> you love the picture of him in Nicaragua. I love that picture. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, you, you don't know a thing about him or what he's no. going to do. But, but we can guess what he's going to do. Right. And that's really the point, that he's he may be a great guy personally, and Barack Obama is a great guy personally, but that's not the point. The point is, what does power do? And without pressure from below, you know, in the whole 5,000 year history of states, it's only in the last couple hundred years that states have done anything to enlarge the realm of human freedom. And then only when power is coming from below. Abolitionism, uh, civil rights, women's liberation, and even in the last five years. Look at three groups that made some progress in the last five years. The queer movement, the, the women, women's freedom and women's reproductive freedom, and the Immigrant Youth Justice League. These are three groups that made some, but they made it because they were noisy, not because they were begging, the, you know, I remember Dan Savage showing up at the White House when Obama was saying, on the gay issue, I'm evolving, and Dan Savage showed up with a big button that said, evolve already. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't af afraid to just jump up and do that, you know, but that's what we have to do. More, yes, say it so they can hear. Sure, um, I guess first, did you, did you wish to contain the questions in the scope of this conversation? No. I wish to explode the questions in the scope of any conversation. Open all together. Um, so I was in, you know, leading up to this night, I, I reread parts of your, your other book and Which watched uh, Fugitive, Fugitive Days, Days and uh, watched the documentary of another undergrad again. And I was looking at some of the, uh, the footage uh, of Vietnam and the bombings that was in, in that a documentary and thinking about this dissonance between then and now and visions and interpretations at that time. Um, my, my question is, or my first, depending on how it goes, is um, have either of you traveled to Vietnam since um, 1975? And if you have, what were your experiences, impressions, ideas? Of, um, well, we, we went once, very unofficially, just the two of us, in 1999. I'm really glad we went it, um, then because it was a different Vietnam than it is now, of course, uh, and different than it was in 1975, too. So uh, we, 
just traveled. We went from Hulong um, Kalong Bay to all the way down to the Mekong. And uh, we went to a lot of uh, we went to a lot of uh, battlefields, we went to Quezon, and we went to, we tried to kind of, I don't know what, we were on a certain kind of pilgrimage. In fact, the peop everybody there thought that we, that he was a vet, you know, because that was the only people, an, a U.S. veteran, that was the only Americans that they'd seen there. In fact, and we only saw one other American the whole time we were there. So it was, it was not that early, but there weren't Americans traveling there. Were Australians and New Zealanders and people like that, um, and uh, we found that um, we asked everybody we met, particularly in the north, but also in the south, uh, about the war. And people invited us into their homes and put out tea and went upstairs and got out scrapbooks, pictures of people who died. Stories. This is after they figured out who we were. Right? Well, you to know, some extent. I don't know what they thought we were, but they were very open. They weren't very scrutinizing, I would say. We had <coughs> many conversations with people, um, you know, given that we didn't, my French was pretty bad and we didn't speak Vietnamese. So we had that kind of conversation with people who spoke, young people who spoke English and older people who spoke French <coughs> and English. So um, it was, you know, it was. I don't know, very, a very moving and dramatic thing. We did the things, you know, we saw Poe's body, stood in line with a lot of school children, and, uh, you know, which he'd forbidden in his will to have happened to him, but there he was, it's you know, horrible. on display, and, uh, like Lennon and, uh, and Mao, and he, uh, and we went to the museums and saw the B downed B-52s and the American artifacts and stuff like that. So that's what we did. Um, and I, I would say that one of the surprise, you know, two things shocked us then and now it's, you know, 14 years later, so it's even more. One is that, you know, the, the majority of people there in 1999 had been born after the war ended. so was the majority of the population. So, it, you know, it was really already a generation that didn't know the American War and knew had other enemies, Vietnam had other primary enemies. Um, secondly, uh, there, I felt that there was, um, there was no, I don't know, there's no demonization. There was no bitterness, of course, at least talking to us, who knows, of course. And, but, you know, but the, the cost of the war was palpable when you talk to people, but it wasn't visible in my mind, trying to have lived out every day of the 10 years, kind of trying to put ourselves in Vietnam under the napalm and the bombing and the chemicals and the relentless strafing and uh, carpet bombing. I, I thought that the land would be barren or large parts it would be barren. Of course, it was grown back, green, lavish tobacco, coffee fields, where the military bases and battlefields had been. So, that's a short, short answer. You know, but for me, the biggest difference, the biggest discovery, was that in Vietnam, even in 1999, they are so over the American war in Vietnam. They're, that's a ancient history to them. And what's fascinating, by contrast, is it's still a living wound for us. And it's not just us old people. Vietnam is a constant reference, and I convinced that, and I'm convinced this is also part of the reason that I got thrust into the into the middle of the media the way I did is because of this so-called link to President Obama. And the right wing just has a big interest in keeping that alive. But the other reason is because Vietnam is not settled for us. Vietnam is a living issue for us. For why? us, he means for America. For, I mean, for America. In the, and, in the entire discourse. And really. why? Because the discourse is so profoundly dishonest so profoundly dishonest, so that that we have yet to come to terms with a kind of truth and reconciliation <clears throat> process that would allow us to say, well, this is what, not that the truth is ever a single thing that you could, but it's a pursuit, and we haven't even done the pursuit. We're not in quest of the truth about Vietnam. If we were, John McCain could not possibly have run as a war hero. War hero in Vietnam? My brother was a hero. He deserted. Wouldn't go there. Wouldn't kill people. Wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be part of it. 
Um, John Kerry has to run from the best thing he ever said as a 25-year-old when he said to the Senate, we commit war crimes in Vietnam every day, not as a matter of, of choice, but as a matter of policy. And I'm interviewed this evening on Wisconsin Public Radio, and the interviewer says um, a couple things that are striking. She says, um, well, we all agree. I, I said exactly what I just said to you. And she said, oh, we, but don't we all agree, Republicans and Democrats, that that war was unwinnable? So that's the narrative about Vietnam. The war can was I, unwinnable. Can I just add yeah, to that? Add so Giap General Giap dies a week ago at 104. And the obit on the front page of the New York Times says in the first two sentences that he, you know, orchestrated the the uh, driving out the French at Dien Bien Phu, and he and he led the military strategy um, that led to led to uh, the U.S. What was the word? Um, Stalemate. No, but then it to, a sentence down, he said they it says uh, because of his military acuity and brilliance. Uh, the war ended in a stalemate. So stalemate. I was crazy. I, of course, I wrote a letter Where to the Times shouting. that they, I knew they wouldn't print. But I spent two hours making each word count because it has to be only two sentences, you know. And uh, stalemate. Are you kidding me? Stalemate? Does, the New York Times covered for a week the last days of the war. Do you, those old people here remember those pictures vividly. A stalemate, you know. Tonsonite Air Force Base overrun by the Vietnamese forces. Well, you know, 60 B-52s lost, the entire U.S. Embassy, all the papers, all the people who were hired by the Americans trying to get out on the helicopters from the roof. So, okay, those images for our generation are vivid, almost as vivid as the Kennedy assassination or something, right? So, but that was a stalemate, a military rout, really, a massive military defeat at the end of 10 years, not to mention a political defeat at home and abroad. So uh, that's the story. And that it was a, a stalemate examples. that we sort of yeah. lost or so couldn't quite win or what. And there's a couple other you know, words it's crazy. that, that it's... are bandied about that are similarly dishonest. So Vietnam was a quagmire. Right. And, and like we dipped our innocent toe into a swamp and then they sucked us in. Nothing like that happened. Or, or you know, um, uh, on and on. But that, that's not why you asked about Vietnam. But you said, what did, what did we see? <laughs> I don't know where you anyway, went. Anyway, we went crazy. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. So what was your follow-up? I'm sorry. That, you got us started. Well, I mean, there's, there's, a, lot, there's a, lot of, a lot of interesting follow-up questions now. I mean, I was, I was interested to a degree in your emotional responses in going to Vietnam and visiting a country which, at a certain point in your lives, you were willing to put your own lives yeah. um, in in jeopardy for, um, and then and then confronting like a place which was you know, presumably you hadn't visited before, right. but yeah, actually yeah. seeing it, meeting people right. that you had a, some some sort of connection with the time to. Right. But I mean, everything that you bring up about historical memory and the the narrative right. and how that narrative here differs from the narrative in Vietnam and how that affects the way people respond to it, it's pretty. Interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. I guess I feel like yeah. using words like quagmire, stalemate, um, words like this, that perpetuates the the, the open wound the in American historical memory. Absolutely. Um, for the Vietnamese people I knew, it was like past. Way it was, past. It was super past, and and it wasn't um, it wasn't going to be. A, a shadow right. that existed over the, their lives. Right. And I think it's been such a political bludgeon here, and the fact that it still goes on, or that anybody's interested in the weather, I don't mean anybody, but I mean Fox News is interested in the weather underground, just tells you something about the kind of strange political discourse we have, really, I, I think. And so <clears throat> we can't face up to war crimes, but, you know, then out of nowhere, depending on what we want, you know, what U.S. political interests are, we find a war crime in Syria, or a war crime in Iraq, Iran, or, you know, it, it's it's so arbitrary, and it's so unbased on what we don't talk about uh, that's our responsibility and what's done in our name. I, I find that juxtaposition just so crazy. It's not that there aren't other things, other crimes being committed in the world. Of course there are, and they do demand our attention. 
But I they think, don't I, demand I our bonds. <laughs> I, I think that bringing up Syria, for example, or, or bringing up torture or drones, or that, one of the problems with not coming face to face with Vietnam is that we continue to perpetuate the same crimes and problems. So, and as peace activists, we spend a lot of time thinking, how can we, re, how can we pre-imagine what's going to come next and set the conditions for a peace movement and also a peace alternative. So take Syria. The day before this brilliant idea came up of taking the weapons, the chemical weapons, and putting them under international control, any one of us could have thought of that. But I didn't think of it. And, I, and I'm ashamed of myself for not thinking of it. But there are other things. So what are a hundred things we can think of so that the next atrocity coming down the road where all the hawks, Lindsey Graham and John McCain, will no problem too big or too small that a guided missile won't help. But also the liberal hawks, they drive me crazier. They're all like, well, we, you know, what Jonathan Alter on television saying, Obama's right to go to the Congress, the Constitution demands it, but they better issue him the war power or no one will ever go again. Dude, which is it? Is it, is it legal? You know. So I'm just saying, what else can we imagine? And among the things we could imagine, I think, is we could say, okay, chemical weapons ban is true, good for the whole world, but let's just take the region. Yes, Syria should get rid of its chemical weapons. Yes, it committed a horrific war crime. And Israel, the only other country in the region that makes and stocks and stores chemical weapons, they should be banned. And nuclear weapons, sure, they should be and you know, here too. And here too. And nuclear weapons, of course, should be dismantled over here. But how about in Israel? Let's make it universal. Let's make it real. And so these are the kind of things I think we need to kind of be much sharper about. But I imagine in the book a process of truth-telling where there's a big stage. I think I have it in the Hollywood Bowl. And here comes Henry Kissinger, John McCain, Bernadine Dorn, Angela Davis, Jane Fonda, um, you know, and Bob Kerry, who committed war crimes, and John Kerry, who said we commit war crimes. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. Everybody gets to come up <laughs> and say what I did and what I'm sorry about. That's what I mean about truth. It's not, we won't all agree, but we'll be searching for something called truth. And that would be a good thing and a healthy thing for us. I doubt that we'll be able to do it until we mobilize a huge peace movement to make it happen. You had something, sir? Yes? Yeah. Um you mentioned the, the interest in the weather underground is still out there. And there was a piece in the New Yorker a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was about Philip Roth and Updike. Yes. And you know, yeah, he's about, yeah, and there you are. And um, talking about his novel, American Pastoral and all that. And how he, the interest in the, the female character, um, the, the young girl who um, joins the underground, uh, and there's a purity to the, um, the female rage that is not found in you. I you know, know. so I you're, know. you know, forget. <laughs> oh, it's women. like this, oh my gosh. <laughs> and <coughs> what do you think about that? Well, I think Updike has a problem. I mean, I think, I think <laughs> Runyon Roth, all of them have a problem with this because, yeah. I mean, there's something, you know, there was this period where Angela Davis and me and the two women from Brandeis were on the 10 most wanted list, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty weird kind of moment in American 10 most wanted history. Or Asada Shakur. <laughs> Look at Asada Shakur. Yeah. Silence for 15, 20 years. She's at political asylum in another country. And suddenly, last year, out of yeah. nowhere, she's <laughs> like, I don't mean out of nowhere, but she's pretty much out of nowhere. No legal thing changed in the situation. And she's She's made on the top ten terrorist list. Most of us didn't know there was a top ten terrorist list. I don't know. Did you know? I didn't know that. Um, but she's on it, and they tripled the bounty on her head. It's really a, a hit an assassination request, I think. Uh, and then our son was driving. Uh, his plane got diverted from New York to... Philadelphia was driving on the New Jersey Turnpike and lit up above the New Jersey Turnpike is, you know, Asada Shakur wanted, didn't say dead or alive, but that was kind of the impression, you know, reward, whatever it is, $2 million. I mean, 
Isn't that crazy? So I think there's there is a voyeuristic and and uh, purient interest, uh, very clearly sexualized about women mm -hmm. revolutionaries, women radicals back in the day. Certainly, J. Edgar Hoover <laughs> himself. J. Edgar um, Hoover called Bernadine La Passionaria of the Lunatic Left, <laughs> and I thought she should put that at the top of her resume. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he also Pretty called. Good. But one of the things I love, we're both on the board of the Jane Addams Hull House Museum, and in his early in his career, J. Edgar Hoover called Jane Addams the most dangerous woman in America, and 50 years later he called Bernadine the most dangerous woman in America. But I do think in his case, and in a lot of their cases, it's that the sexualizing of, and, and the kind of combining sex and violence is particular to women of a certain kind of temperament and style and whatnot. The other thing, though, that you make me think is one of the odd things is, you know, people like Fox News try to keep the weather underground alive and breathing for their own purposes. I, I have other purposes to keep it alive and breathing, but that's another point. But, but I think what's interesting is 40 years later, the weather underground has kind of slipped into a, um, it's become a kind of an accepted something. So David Denby reviewing the Robert Redford movie mm -hmm. doesn't say, they were members of the Weather Underground. You know that group I hate because they did such a... He just says they were members of the Weather Underground. End of story. You know, um, you mentioned The New Yorker. Um, Adam Gopnik had a discussion about, about Edmund Burke in which he describes him as the, um, the disillusioned... The, not the disillusioned radical, but the shocked liberal who, um, who is so sent over the edge by the extremism of the radicals you know, he's a man of reform, but sent over the edge. And for Edmund Burke, it was, it was the Jacobins. But for, this is what he Gottnick says. He says, for Upper West Side liberals, it's Woodstock and the Weathermen. You know, so suddenly we're just this kind of brand. You know, this out there, which kind of strikes us as funny because we're still alive, but um, <laughs> barely. But you know, it would be like if you or I wrote something about the Wobblies, we wouldn't say. So and so was in the Wobblies. You know that group that we kind of like, except the assassination shit was no good. You know we wouldn't feel we don't need to say that because that's just assumed that the Wobblies were what they were. But that's what I feel has happened to the Weather Underground in an odd way. Forty years later, except for Fox News, which keeps us alive and breathing. You know? <laughs> anyway, more others. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> parts of the book that I really. Uh, like the most, or when you're talking about your children, both raising your children uh, and their role in being your sort of cabinet as you were dealing with all of these uh, attacks. And I guess, uh, um, so I want to congratulate you on bringing these kids up right, uh, uh, clearly in difficult circumstances. But my question is, and this is also addressed to you, Bernadine, um, Bill, and your, your stories and, and, and uh, um, in, in public, it's well known what, what you have paid as the result of uh, all of this regurgitation. How about you, Bernadine? You have an equally uh, um, uh, stellar career in law, and your kids are, are professionals. Um, has it cost you and them anything? Well, them, you'd have to ask them. Okay. You know, I think I think it has cost them, but they they grew up with it, and they put up with it and they, you know, just say, I don't know how they, they each deal separately with it, okay. Um, and, uh, um, but I, I, I don't think it's cost, I mean, yes, of course, I didn't get admitted to the bar, I didn't practice law, but I was a law professor for 23 years. How bizarre is that? That just is, I don't know what, it's privilege and being white and it's a lot of crazy things. But it is bizarre, and it's not exactly what I would have predicted. Um, but it allowed me to do, you know, to to be a political organizer and agitate and teach and learn and do human rights and criminal law, and it was, you know, I had a great time of it. So I don't feel, um, you know, and then suddenly I don't exist. I mean, it's yeah, that was that's been pretty weird. That's a story in itself. You know, literally just overnight. I didn't exist, and Bill founded everything and started everything, and did everything. <laughs> so it, it's a it's just weird. It isn't even that it's sexist. It's just weird, you know. So 
that's it. I'm glad you picked up on the thing about the kids, partly because I'm surprised when I finally finished this book that it's more about raising kids and being a teacher than I would have predicted when I sat down to write it. It's overwhelmingly about being a teacher and it's stories of teaching. And yes, there's stuff about the tea party and this and that, but, but the real theme of the book, if, if the theme of Fugitive Days is how do you live a life in a, in a time of crisis and upheaval, in a world in flames that doesn't make a mockery of your values, this book takes that same theme and it says over a long period of time, in changing circumstances, in, you know, in less than revolutionary times, how do you stay true to the passions and the commitments that ignited you when you were 20? You know, and frankly, I don't feel a disconnect from any of that. And that's why people say, well, I'm sorry about that, and now you're a good professor. And no, I'm not. I, it's actually all of a piece to me, right? Chesa, there's one little story in here where the Weather Underground film is showing in New York, and we met up with our guys, a couple of them were in New York, grown now. And we had a Mexican dinner and too many drinks, and we went and saw the film. And then during the Q&A, somebody asked, what was it like being for your kids, having you for parents. And Chase, our youngest son, was probably 24 or 5 at the time. He was sitting in the front row beaming with a red face because he had two margaritas or something. And I looked at him and he said, sure. He got up and he said, he said to the questioner, what was it like for you growing up with your weird parents? You know? <laughs> and, uh, and he said, you know, we all grow up in something, you know, weird religions, weird family trips to see the crazy uncle. All this shit is part of what we all have. And what we had growing up was we had two things. One is we had parents who loved us and cared about us and were committed to us. And we had a kind of a roiling, you know, dinner, kind table. Of dinner table that was constantly talking politics, doing stuff. You know, we, you know, for them, I mean, you know, for them, from a very early age, that's not fair, had the same tone whether they were talking about, you know, some terrible thing that happened in the playground or a police murder in Brooklyn. You know what I mean? Like, that's not fair. That was their kind of, their ethics, their politics. And I remember Bill once, tells, can I tell the story one? in here? Bill tell, has a wonderful story in here about how when Zaid was three, I think. A year and a half, I think, because it was tough. No, so. because he didn't, it, it took more. Yeah. Talk. But in any event, we were, he, we'd taken him to a swim class and in New York, downtown, and then when we were coming out of it, I think he was on Bill's shoulder and we were looking for something to eat, and uh, there was a demonstration going by and people were chanting, no more porn, no more porn, you know? <laughs> and so we joined the demonstration for a block until we saw the pizza place. and he, then we went and got pizza. And so Zaid's sitting there eating the pizza, and he says, uh, that was really fun. Why don't we like corn? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of... I'm going to say one other thing, though, you know, about, about Marty, about the, the price that Bernadine paid. You know, um, you know, she... Your point is absolutely right, that she... I mean, I get a lot of threatening letters, and some of them are in here. I mean, I have this one day during the 2008 campaign where there was a UIC cop, a university cop, who was supposed to kind of watch me. And I would call him now and then when I got these threatening letters, and he came over one day, and I had two letters. One was from, um, one was from the Waco Justice League, and they were going to come and kidnap me and waterboard me. And the other was from New Orleans, I think, Louisiana. And they were going to come, and they had my home address in the letter, and they were going to come and assassinate me. And Officer Muhammad was a really good guy. His parents were Black Panthers, and he had, had the name Muhammad. And uh, <laughs> couldn't make that up. And, um, and he looked at the letters, he shook his head, and he said, I hope the assassins get here before the waterboarders, because it would be horrible to be waterboarded and then shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have that kind of shit going on. But all the, all the hate mail that I get, and I write about this some in here, Bernadine, I, oh, Bernadine is often included, and it's often with the most degrading, sexualized, violent kinds of imagery. So I'm going to be shot and waterboarded, but what she's going to get is so much worse, and the fantasies are just so horrendous. So there is that. And then there's the matter of, which I'm going to just read one tiny little thing about, because there's the matter of Bernadine being called before a grand jury after the Brinks robbery. We adopted our son Chase at 14 months old. His parents, Kathy Boudin and David Gilbert, 
were arrested for this Brinks robbery in Nyack, New York. And Bernadine was, one morning, when we were going on our way to daycare, confronted by two guys in brown shoes and, you know, um, whatever FBI agents wear, whatever. They were marshals. They were marshals, federal <laughs> marshals. And she was served paper and she had to <coughs> appear before a grand jury. And it was probably the most agonizing decision she's made in her life. A grand jury can bring you in, it's a star chamber, and interrogate you. You have no right to a lawyer, no cross-examination. And Bernadine took the position that if I have free speech, I have the right to remain silent. That's not true under the law. It was only her own legal theory. Um, they said, no, we're compelling you to testify. They took her before a grand jury. Zaid and I went down with her to court. They took her in, and they locked her up. And one whole section here is about the brilliant BJ pioneering the idea of how you visit a parent in prison with little kids, um, the kind of things that you do to make it an adventure and not just an ordeal, really quite moving and beautiful of BJ to do that. But Bernadine was facing an indeterminate sentence. The, the judge said to her right in the beginning, the keys to, to the cell are in your mouth. If you talk, you get out. Remember Monica Lewinsky's mother, same deal. Um, if you talk, tell, tell about your daughter's sex life, you get out. If you don't, you're in forever, seemingly. And it's hard to know when you'll get out. So it feels like a life sentence, even though it grinds on day by day. So she went to federal lockup. It turned out to just be, what, eight months? Something like eight months. But as we were enduring it, it felt much longer than that. Um, but our lawyer, who we had breakfast with yesterday in New York, a really great kind of crazy anarchist Irishman, um, came up with an idea. In the course of her being in federal lockup, probably 150 lawyers had visited her, um, mostly lawyers, guild folks, people. She was the head of the student committee of lawyers, guild for a long time. And, and Michael's idea was get every lawyer to sign an affidavit saying, I've seen her in lockup, and she will never talk. No matter what you do to her, she won't talk. It'd be a year, five years, 20 years, she'll never talk. And she took that position in part because when we were on the run, the Weather Underground, they convened grand juries around us all the time. And many, many heroic, ordinary people stood up and wouldn't talk. And that's how you defeat that kind of nonsense is by refusing to participate. So Michael gathered a gazillion affidavits from lawyers, mostly grungy folks like us, but a couple of establishment lawyers, one of whom wrote, Bernadine Dorn has a, um, a Joan of Arc complex. She thinks she's a martyr. She will, and for that reason, she will never talk. Um, all we wanted her to say is she will never talk, because there's a, a fine point in the law. You can hold somebody <coughs> to compel their testimony, but you cannot hold them to punish the person. So you can't punish her for not testifying. You can compel her testimony. So we had all these things, and the judge after a lot of wrangling and back and forth, the judge agreed with the argument and let her out. So we won. Um, is that a fair description? Fair enough? Fair enough. Let me read this. Um, Bernadine gets out of jail, and this is just a couple paragraphs. I raced uptown and rounded up the kids and then raced back down to meet Bernadine coming out the door. Ecstasy. We all waltzed and pirouetted and rock and rolled to to the Kennedy's favorite family-style spot in Little Italy, just a couple of blocks from the Metropolitan Correctional Center. Michael bought bo brought bottles of champagne and sparkling apple juice, and we piled into the huge booth in the back and celebrated with heaping platters of homemade lasagna, pe penny primavera, and fettuccine alfredo, as well as warm bread fresh from the oven, slathered with extra virgin olive oil, mashed garlic, and diced peppers, Italian peanut butter, according to the Kennedys. When the Italian ices were ordered, I headed to the men's room. Frankie, the owner who'd introduced himself when we arrived, stopped me in the wood paneled hallway. Yo, he said, our eyes level, his face close to mine. What's the celebration? His salt and pepper hair was slicked back, his body broad and muscled, and he had no neck. It was an uncomfortably narrow hallway. But his tone was curious and friendly, not the least bit menacing, as if he wanted some reason to join in and share the collective joy. I hesitated wanting to avoid the Brinks robbery, the Black Liberation Army, the Weather Underground just now, swallowed hard and settled on an abbreviated version of the truth. My wife just got up out of prison, I said. Federal lockup. No shit, he said. His eyes bulged as his voice lowered to conspiracy level. That lovely lady over there? He cocked his head toward Bernadine, covered with kids. Yes, that's her, I said. 
What was she in for? he asked, wrinkling his brow, curious and quite friendly still, and then apologetically, that is, if you don't mind my asking. I swallowed hard once more and plunged on, but still in short form, avoiding the content of the case. She, refu she refused to talk to a federal grand jury, I said. She refused to cooperate. No shit, he repeated emphatically, astonishment mixed with awe. The content seemed to matter not at all to him. No shit, his voice rising in admiration. The admiration, he added, beautiful, good for her. She's a real stand-up chick. Yes, she is, I said, and Frankie picked up the check. <laughs> okay, I think we, we'll call it quits unless anybody has a, a shout-out or we can, yeah, you want to say something? Mike? I just want to put in one quick plug. Uh, we had Bill in town two years ago oh, yes. for his, the 25th anniversary of Rethinking Schools, and the first restaurant we had, we had lined up to have our event at, uh, I had asked for a contract, and the owner had said, my word's my contract, we don't need anything. Well, as soon as Charlie Sykes called him, the right wing got a uh, whiff of it and called him and threatened to boycott the restaurant, he pulled out right away. Well, as the owner's a stonefly, Kitty Cross from here, uh, over here, that uh, actually put on our event there, they stood by us, they literally got hundreds of emails and angry phone calls, including one letter that was so violent, not just to get threatening Bill, but also threatening their establishment, that at one point I went down to the local police station with a copy of the letter to inform them of, of, of it so that they were aware of the type of threats they were getting. But they stood by us, they held the event there, so <clears throat> If you want to support some people willing to put their necks out, you can also go have a beer or something to eat over at the Stone Fly there. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, Marty some boy. And that was, and that was the, the, when I spoke there, and it was a lovely event, and mm -hmm. gazillions of people came. Because Rethinking Schools is another one of those institutions here in Milwaukee that's just to die for. But that was also when Occupy was going on. Mm -hmm. So some of us yeah. spent the afternoon early at Occupy and then came over and did that event. But it was a marvelous weekend and you're absolutely right it was a, at first i thought we were going to cancel but then you guys worked so hard mm -hmm. and found the right people mm -hmm. to stand up with us and as soon as you stand up all that other shit just starts to fade away and they had a wimpy little picket line over there and <laughs> i can't remember they had some very funny signs um, mm -hmm. But I remember going over to talk to them for a while. They were like, you know, oh. I love talking. There's a great section in the book called Talking to the Tea Party. And Bill, you know, unlike most of us, I don't think this would have been my response. To go back to your questions about my response, the differences, you know. But Bill just, you know, wades right into the crowd that has pictures of him saying, you know, domestic terrorist killed. I have a great picture terrorist. of me outside a bookstore, arm in arm with a woman holding it. We're both smiling. She's got an American flag in one hand, then a sign that said, Bill Ayers is a terrorist in the other word. <laughs> but, you know, he just really has these great conversations with them about what to agree about and what not to agree about. And, you know, it is they also the people who turn out are people with a wide range of ideas, you know, thought through and not thought through like the rest of us. And uh, so he, you know, he had initially thought about having the book called Talking to the Tea Party. Yeah. Because it, it, it uh, you know, that's possible too. Not the death threats and the stupid shit, but, you know, the actual people who mm -hmm. compose it. But our job remains our job. Movement building, mobilizing, organizing, and let's change the world. Thanks so, so much. <laughs>